Next Door Neighbors is made possible by the support of the Nissan Foundation. Trying to understand both cultures all at once, it was a struggle. The most part is missing the old friends, you know. It took me seven and a half years to see my son again. So that was, that was very, very hard for me. Becoming American, for immigrants and refugees, it means a new home, a new identity. Those fleeing the atrocities of war or the burden of poverty are offered hope in the prospect of peace and prosperity. Yet, even after reaching a safer shore, crossing the cultural divide can take years, and finding a balance between one's traditional values and the realities of day-to-day -day life in the United States can be a struggle. During the next half hour, we'll share the stories of four individuals faced with making a new home in a new land. How will age, education, family, and culture affect their ability to succeed in America? We begin with the story of a Murfreesboro woman who made a bet on her future by making a break with the past. Sisavong Puttavong Houghton is a wife, mother of two, and professor of art at Middle Tennessee State University. She's called the United States home since she was a small child, but her journey began like thousands of Laotian refugees who fled the communist takeover of Laos in the mid-1970s. We were in Bing Chan, which is where my dad worked at. He was a, a doctor who also worked with the Red Cross. Because he was affiliated with the Red Cross, we needed to leave because that's part of the U.S. If you didn't leave, you'd probably be put in a another camp of some sort to, or, or they just shoot you. My mom found this lady who was going to help us get out of Laos and so she paid her and, and told her to bring all your stuff to us this night and we would then help you cross over the Mekong River, escape Laos. What we found out the next night was she took everything and left us with no boats, which she said she was going to have boats there ready for us. And so my father and cousins and some friends had to get this makeshift boat together and, you know, cross over from the Mekong into Thailand. And so uh, they lost everything. Um, my brother almost died on the way there. They, you know, they had seven kids and they were trying to count heads and he was like almost drowning. Sisavon and her family did make it to Thailand. Once there, her father was placed in prison and the women and children were sent to refugee camps. The story was that I cried so much for my father that they let him go. They said, well, we either kill the father or we kill the child. So they let the father go because apparently my loud mouth allowed for him to live. After two years in a Thai refugee camp, Sisavon and her family were accepted into the U.S. Refugee Resettlement Program. In 1980, they, along with other Laotian refugees, would begin a new life in Kansas. Growing up in a Laotian household in America, uh, just straight out from, you know, refugee camp, uh, you really get a sense of uh, a disconnect trying to understand both cultures all at once. It was a struggle. Every child's different, and um, as a kid, I, I personally did not take learning seriously in terms of school period. And because my parents were not involved in my education, they didn't really understand that. So I didn't pass second grade. I redid second grade. It's probably the best thing I've ever done. But then it taught me that I need to be serious. In spite of her initial struggles, Sisavon may have benefited by her age at immigration. Young children seem to have an easier time learning a new language. And those who do immigrate before age 13 usually do as well in school as their American-born classmates. I realized that the, you know, in second grade that if I didn't make the grades that I wasn't going to move on. I later on, you know, then became valedictorian. Uh, I got straight A's. I made really good grades in college and, um, and I knew that education was the way to get what I wanted in life. And so that was important because I saw these girls, you know, who the Laotian girls who then wouldn't do well. Most of them are still working in factory jobs and, you know, they're still in that community. 
Despite the educational benefits of coming to the U.S. at a young age, Sisavan and her Laotian peers face the cultural and socioeconomic challenges familiar to new refugees. Even today, 38 percent of Laotian students do not graduate from high school, indicating barriers to education that can span generations. In the sense, it was kind of like, you know, you're not you're not going to amount to anything because this isn't your country. And I had to really overlook that as a kid to think, oh, you know, I don't think that's true. And I didn't allow for myself to get stuck in that kind of way of thinking and life that I couldn't amount to anything just because, you know, we, we came over as a refugee and that we didn't have any money. As a young woman, Sisavan realized that to achieve her goals, she would have to make her own path. Making a break from the Laotian community, maybe that wasn't something I thought I was trying to do, but in a sense, I, you know, I was doing uh, because there is uh, this certain stigma about being a woman and being Laotian. Sisavan met Dr. Ida Fudzilla, associate professor of anthropology at MTSU, while teaching in the same building. They immediately bonded over a shared set of experiences. Fazilla not only studies immigrant communities, but she too is a Southeast Asian immigrant who can speak firsthand about the challenges facing young women from traditional societies. I think there are issues that immigrant women have to deal with and negotiate all the time. Huh? Women are expected to be housewives, they are expected to be dutiful daughters, they are expected to stay home and be good mothers to their children. So things that don't fit into those categories, things like pursuing a higher education, going to college, um, getting a well-paying job, doing something that you love outside of the home, these are not necessarily things that are seen as appropriate for women when they come from more traditional or more patriarchal societies. Younger people, when they come here, they feel the pull of traditional expectations. Um, they feel the pressure of living their lives as if they were still in Laos, or they were still in Malaysia, or they were still in wherever they first came from. And that is a pressure people at times reject because this is a different country, and there are different opportunities and there are different um, choices that can be made. Determined from childhood not to let cultural barriers keep her from attaining her goals, Sisavan found her calling within the artistic community and the halls of higher education. For me to move on and to have an education, I pursued what I wanted to pursue, which maybe that's very American to do what you want to do, and so I end up being a painter and getting my bachelor's of fine arts and art, and then later on my master's so then I could teach. You know, am I Laotian, am I American? I, I, you know, whatever it is that I am, I, I just felt I was in the arts and being in the arts made me feel home. The people, the, you know, the sense of community, that, that was my people, that was my tribe. There is the idea that you are either from here or you're from somewhere else. Uh, but what I see is when you come to the United States or any other place, a lot of times what you experience is actually a, a third kind of um, belonging, right? So you are not from your old place, you're not from your new place. You're a mix of the old and the new. And I think that's the perspective that's interesting. While taking what may be considered a non-traditional path, Sisavan still pays tribute to her Laotian roots through her artwork. And my work has always kind of dealt with identity, identity of self, identity of culture, where did I come from, pieces that dealt with also escaping Laos, um, making works uh, about boats and travel and nesting and what is a home. Home is people who have similar beliefs and values. They might be, you know, from Mars, but it doesn't matter, right? Because uh, you can talk to them about certain things and, and so they understand you. It's, it's not necessarily a concrete, tangible place you go back and resort to or a certain ethnicity or, you know, a certain culture. I think home has such a broad definition to it. 
that's for me what home is. Without community, family, and a sense of belonging, it can be difficult to truly feel at home. For young people in particular, having friends and fitting in are central to their happiness. But as you'll see, cultural divisions, including language and family values, can make navigating American society difficult for teenagers. Teens like A and Zara, whom you're about to meet. High school can be tough. It's even tougher if you have to contend with cultural and language barriers, to which A and Zara can attest. Both attend John Overton High School, and both have faced difficulties adapting to life in Tennessee. Zara's problems center on a clash of cultures. And the cursing, I can't believe they, they use the F word with everything they say. I was like, how oh, they're humans, why they curse a lot? while A's issues are broader and deeper. People and, you know, school and uh, life is stress, you know. My family and I went to refugee, refugee camp because uh, of a war going on and we just had to flee to Thailand just to be safe. A was still a toddler when his family was forced from their home in Burma to escape a decades-long campaign by the government to drive out the Karen people. They would spend three years in the refugee camp, along with tens of thousands of their fellow Burmese, before being allowed to come to Nashville. Thrust into a new school and a new world where simply communicating was a challenge, A's problems intensified when he was singled out for being different. Yeah, I had trouble like fitting with other kids because I was Asian and I just don't fit with nobody, honestly. When I first started school, I, I got bullied a lot. I never talk about it. I never like reach for help because honestly, I, I just like don't want to bother people because this is my problem and not them. I just don't like to ask for help. A lot of refugees are like that, you know. And like many refugees, A was also feeling pressure from home to learn English quickly. My parents was counting on me, you know, just to translate for them and everything, but it's hard for me to like translate because I couldn't understand the, the, what words I'm reading, but can't translate all of it, you know, because I just don't know how. My parents thought I was useless and I just go to school and sleep. We have students who, not only are they trying to learn English, but often their parents are assuming they're going to learn English quickly and then navigate systems for them, begin translating, troubleshooting, solving problems for them. So there's quite a bit of pressure on those students to be the first sort of bridge, uh, the connector between the family and systems in, in the city. Zara had problems communicating as well, mainly due to shyness. When I first come here, my first two days, like, I didn't even talk to anybody. It was very hard at the beginning, and then I didn't come to school after that for a week because I was afraid somebody will ask me something I know. I went home and told my mom that it's very hard. Everything is different. My mom said, it's okay. It's only the beginning. The beginning of Zara's journey took place in Iraq, which underwent drastic changes around the time of her fifth birthday. As Zara grew up, the quality of life in Iraq declined. After 10 years, her parents had had enough. Zara's father would remain in Iraq to care for his aging parents, while Zara and her three siblings would migrate with their mother to Nashville, where 15-year-old Zara experienced culture shock. Yeah, like, you see two couples kissing on the corner, something like that, I was like, what? What are you doing? It was very shocking. I can't like, I don't know, what? I, like, I was like that. I look at them, no, I walk, just walk fast. Um, because it's something, if you do that in Iraq, they would arrest you. It's a very bad thing. Uh, the girls are like, they show their chest or bellies and stuff like that. I didn't like the idea of seeing people wearing very short stuff. But Zara does like the idea of some American freedoms. In fact, that's how she defines her peers. 
to be American teen is like to be mostly free and do stuff on your own. You can go out for a long time. You can have a lot of fun. This is where culture clash hits home for Zara in the form of an age-old double standard. My mom is less strict with my brother because in our culture, guys can have more opportunities than girls. Girls like have to be like, you know, at home. Guys can be out whatever time they want. My mom told me, don't even think about that. <laughs> and she resents being treated differently. I think the girls should get the same opportunities the boys get. When I was uh, working in the school system, I often uh, helped create support groups, especially for girls. We were sort of helping them figure out how to continue to respect and abide by the rules from home, yet they see messages about dress, about sexuality, about behavior, about independence, leaving home, which directly uh, conflict with home culture. And so it's very important for young people to figure out a way to have a balance. And so sometimes that creates real struggle for, especially I think for young girls. I think for young men, it's not the same problem. So a lot of it is thinking about how do we help girls navigate that and, and remain on good terms with their parents and yet figure out who they are. I think that's happened for generations. That first generation of immigrant students have to uh, enter into the new American sort of culture yet keep those ties. Keeping those cultural ties is important to A as well, but that's getting harder as the Karen become more American. And we barely see each other anymore. Like when we first came here, we all get to live in a, you know, apartment where like you, we could see the whole people, like the neighbors that came to America with us, we could like stay together. But right now, when they live here more than four or five years, they start buying the houses and everybody just start doing their own thing. You know? Every, everything just fell apart. Like, everybody just moved away from each other. The most part is missing the old friends, you know. Losing touch with those friends and his continuing struggle with English have made high school less of a priority. I started skipping because I wasn't able to like speak English like, you know, professional English, you know. I just feel like, you know, giving up on everything. Just like, don't want to come to school anymore, you know, because it's like stressful, you know, to come here and take classes which are like boring, you know. The United States as a whole is grappling with this issue of how do we help these students stay in school. It is their best chance at success if they, the longer they stay in our schools and learn English. You have students who are extremely resilient, who are able to come in and sort of find their place and figure that out. You have others that really struggle, and I think you begin to weigh your options and think, I could just go to work. What, what, what should I be doing here? Uh, is this the appropriate placement for me? But those that really recognize the longer they stay in the school and the, and the teachers that work to keep them in the school, the better. I think it would be really beneficial for our society as a whole if those students could stay in school till they're 21 and we create a, a sort of a system for them to do that. I think it, it would be beneficial for everybody. Hopefully, A will realize the benefits of staying in school. He doesn't have to look far for inspiration. I really want to do good for them because they say I'm the oldest and I'm counting on you. It hits me, you know, like you know, I want to be like successful just for them, you know, and pay the bills for them, you know, and feed the family because family is all we got, right? Yeah, so successful is the key, man. And as for Zara's dreams of becoming American, she'll continue to wait and hope. I want her to give me more like time, like stay with my friends or like go out more. Maybe in the future that will change for me. It will take time and my mom changing her thoughts about freedom. Despite the cultural challenges foreign-born teenagers face, education and family are key to a young person's success. Our final story features Brindali Minhivar. She arrived in the U.S. in her late teens, knowing little of the challenges that lie ahead and lacking the support of family or formal education. For Brindali, as for many immigrants, it's the story of hard work and sacrifice. 
came to the U.S. when I was 17, and I then met my daughter's father. You know, I was very young and naive, and um, he was older. When we're young and you don't have someone telling you what's good or bad, uh, you make some wrong decisions sometimes. And he said that he was uh, separating. It, it was not true. I just got mad. I just decided, okay, you know what, I'm leaving. I find out that I was pregnant. And so I went to El Salvador and my son was born there. And that leads to the next problem. She was now a single mother of two with very few options, but desperate situations were nothing new to the teenager. Throughout Brindali's young life, desperation had been the only constant. When I was a little girl, I lived in a village in El Salvador. It was poor, very poor. I just remember when my dad and my mom were fighting and they split. After that, I don't remember seeing my mom again. And I then stayed with my grandmother and she had 13 kids. So I think that's why she kind of treated me differently. She was kind of mean. <laughs> I was about eight when, when it, it started. At night, we were in bed sleeping already and, and we heard someone knocking on the door. That was at my grandmother's house and, and that, that was the uh, gorillas coming for my dad. And, and he knew that he'd done something bad, so he hid. When my grandma opened the door, I just remember, you know, them putting a gun on her head, forehead, and we were just lucky that, you know, they didn't kill us or did anything else to us. And so because they couldn't find my dad, you know, they went and grabbed my uncle. And the next morning, I remember um, going to, to my aunt's house because there was a lot of people there outside and I went to see what was the crowd doing there, and it was there was my uncle on the floor with 30 shots on the back. Marked for death, Brindali's father narrowly escaped to Belize with his young daughter. Over the next several years, they never really had a place to call home. Constantly on the move, Brindali only managed to get a sixth grade education before her failed attempt to begin a new life in California. Five years after that attempt, the young mother again realized the futility of her situation. Seeing my kids with no shoes, with no clothing, no food, and if they get sick, okay, so what can I give them if I stay in this situation? You know, I mean, education. I mean, they're not gonna have an education. You know, if I stay there um, with no, making almost nothing, it broke my heart seeing them the way we were, you know, so poor. I couldn't make money because I had no education, for one, and no one to help me, really. I said, I have to go back to the States because, because I have to make sure that my kids are gonna be okay. I was 22 years old when I came back the second time to the States and uh, left my son and my daughter in Belize. And it took me seven and a half years to see my son again. So that was, that was very, very hard for me. Returning to California, Brindali found a job at a dry cleaners, working six, sometimes seven days a week. She had only one goal in mind, reuniting her family. I would call them every week just to make sure they know I was still here, you know, for them and working and sending the money, paying everything for them, and that I would bring them back as soon as I have the opportunity again. But yeah, I, it, it was hard for them and myself. Due to financial setbacks and bureaucratic red tape, Brindali's oldest son would turn 15 before she could afford to bring him to California, but it was worth the wait. That was very 
emotional it's because finally we got to be together and that's how it should should have been but we had to sacrifice ourselves in order to um, reach that that moment right there and now we're very close I am very proud of them each one of them are very special growing up the way they grew up they were patient with me you know although even though I was not giving them all the attention I needed to give them you know but they understood that I was trying my best to like really provide for other stuff, you know, but I feel bad that I didn't, I couldn't spend more time with them because of work and everything else. But, but they're, they're good kids. They understand and they're, I'm proud of them. With her family reunited, Brindale shifted focus to attaining a GED and opening a business in the food service industry. And after a chance visit to Tennessee, she decided to relocate to Nashville. The people here are very nice. <laughs> I've been to other states and this is like one of the states where, you know, people are so laid back and I like the um, back country because I grew up like that. So it reminds me like back home. And, um, and there's a lot of opportunities here too. It's a, it's a good place to live. She also found much needed help starting her business in Casa Azafran's commercial kitchen. I moved here in Nashville to, to start a food truck called Churro Queens. The health departments required a kitchen, to have a kitchen, a commercial kitchen to go to and bring the food truck there and, and, and do, you know, cook our food and prep everything. So I was looking all over Nashville and um, someone told me about Conexión America at uh, Mesa Comal. And um, that's where I end up. I went to talk to the uh, manager there kitchen manager and and I end up you know clicking with her and and we started doing some some paperwork and that's where I end up it was a really good thing I, I felt that that was meant to to be I was meant to be there you know because uh, they helped me a lot I felt like we all work as a team in that kitchen Despite the support of Casa Azafran, Churro Queens eventually closed. Brindale now works with a Nashville catering business. Even though I, I experienced a lot of loss and disappointment, and even with my, my own business, but it, I didn't let that bring me down. Life is too short. I can start over. I'm not going to stay in that situation never too late to keep going and pursue what you, you want to do. And don't give up. <laughs> like Sisavan, A, and Zara, Brindale's story is still being written, but together they paint a fuller picture of what it takes to be American today. You can find all our stories online anytime at wnpt.org forward slash next door neighbors. Thanks for watching. Next Door Neighbors is made possible by the support of the Nissan Foundation.